Hello and welcome to episode 6 of the Actual Magician, yes I am an Actual Magician's bookshelf and today we're going to be covering The Structure of Magic by Richard Bandler and John Grinder with an introduction by Virginia Satia and Gregory Bateson and it's Virginia Satia that we're going to be coming back to take a look at which is one of the important things um, for me at least about this particular book other than the picture of a wizard on the front which I'm slowly growing the beard to emulate and the structure of magic so this is a book on NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and towards the end of this video, which is unscripted, so we'll see where we go with it, um, I'll be giving a uh, recommendation for a book that I think is a very good introduction to NLP if you want to find out about it. I have my own book called NLP Magic, which I wrote with the hindsight of about 15, 20 years of working with clients using NLP and Ericksonian hypnotherapy, which you can also check out. But the uh, book I'll give at the end is a really good introduction. It's the sort of book that I say, if you want to explain NLP to someone who doesn't know anything about NLP and that hardly mentions NLP, then this is the book for you. It's the book I gave my dad when he wanted to know uh, what I was getting up to with this so-called NLP stuff. So The Structure of Magic is the book we're going to take a look at. But first of all, I just wanted to take a self-indulgent wander through my collection to give you a, um, a bit of a bank story to how this particular book, The Structure of Magic, fell into my life and how it took another 30 years, I guess, for NLP and to actually become part of my everyday life and my career even. Um, there's a bit of a backstory to it, so I'd like to share a few items from my collection of science fiction books to set the context for that, if you will indulge me for just one moment. So the book I'd like to actually mention is Dune by Frank Herbert, which is increased um, in its popularity with the um, Denis Villeneuve film. Um, very unlike the film that I only remember mainly for Patrick Stewart yelling atomics and sting and a lot of other things in the David Lynch version of the film. Um, which has its own unique charm, shall we say. Um, but obviously a lot more people are now coming into contact with you. Now, this is my reading copy of the book, which you can see has travelled around for quite a while. And there's a, a nice classic science fiction illustration on the back. But this was the book I was reading also at the time that I was introduced to Structure of Magic and why it took hold. And just in terms of going back in time, Dune was written the year I was born, 1965, and this is the original um, paperback edition of Dune. Um, here's the um, first edition hardback of Dune. So I tend to collect science fiction uh, classics as well as occult classics and the map of um, Arrakis on the back there. But more interestingly, and as part of this segue, I guess, into occultism, the Dune Encyclopedia, which Frank Herbert did take as canon, even though a lot of the ideas have been um, removed out of this book um, in some of the later rewritings of, of the Dune saga or continued um, writings on the Dune saga. Uh, the interesting thing in the Dune Encyclopedia is the Dune Tarot, which appears in Dune Messiah, and there's even a um, sort of set of illustrations for what the Dune Tarot might look like. But there's a really fascinating article in this. And Frank Herbert, in an interview, mentions Tarot and other forms of divination, which he sees as being, he called them sparks, I think, igniters of human um, intuition, which, again, we're going to come back to. And then even going back further um, in the Dune history, here's the very first appearance of Dune World by Frank Herbert in analogue 
um, science fiction magazine, 1963, two years before I was born. And um, just to complete that um, circle, it, it appears in um, a trilogy, well, in, uh, in three sections in Analog magazine. And just to complete the circle, if we take a look at a couple of the illustrations for Dune World, we can see a scene that you'll be familiar with in the film where um, Jessica meets the um, Fremen with the Chris knife. So there's, there's the very first depiction of that scene um, that we now see, obviously, in the movie. And there's some of the interesting illustrations in that as well. So why, why have I gone down that um, sidetrack of Dune, other than the fact that there is a Dune tarot? Um, when I was first introduced to Structure of Magic by a sales guy in terms of communication theory, uh, when I was about 19, I think, um, he gave it to me as a recommendation as being a book about language and therapy. And when I read this, which is basically about language, um, John Grinder was a linguist and uh, Richard Bandler was a sort of maverick computer person. Um, it's mainly about language and it's almost incomprehensible to non-linguists, um, all of these... Um, sort of uh, uh, flow diagrams at the back showing how language is, is actually structured and formed. But the interesting thing about this that stood out to me is A, the fact that he was couched in an esoteric sort of language, even from the title, The Structure of Magic, and that was part of a sort of rebellious um, street to um, Bandler and Grinder, uh, with regard to the psychotherapies of the time. And this book was um, uh, published in 1975, so uh, the mid-70s, 1975, and dedicated to Virginia Satir, which we're going to come back to as being very influential on my own work and also useful uh, reading in terms of self-development, authenticity, uh, therapy, counselling, and so forth. But in The Structure of Magic, I tried to read this book at the time, and it has a lot of transcripts of uh, therapy sessions and so forth, broken down into X's and Y's and referential indexes and deletions and noun arguments and so forth. And I really didn't get a lot of it other than the fact that it was about language. But the thing I did get from it was this particular section here on the actual overview of successful therapy and change. And on page 54, it lays out um, well-formed sentences. And the interesting thing about this is it made the bridge for me to um, Dune because I was reading both of these at the same time, and to me, this seemed like it was the map or model or methodology of the Bene Gesserit in Dune. The idea that they had trained themselves in observation, in um, the ability to read people and their motives from posture, from eye movements, from all sorts of verbal cues as well, and could even almost communicate telepathically through their development of natural language skills and observation skills. So it seemed to me I was like enamoured by this idea that um, language and communication provided us a gateway to a deeper understanding of our own motives, motivations, and that of other people. So, of course, it, it fascinated me at the time. And as an esotericist, as a magician, the idea that this had some connection with magic was to pave the way for all of my later works, for example, Terosophy and Terosophy Squared, that I brought NLP firmly into tarot reading and the view of tarot as a language 
And so we can see the backbone of Tarosophy is actually laid all the way back when I was 17, 19 maybe, um, with these sorts of uh, strange linguistic diagrams. The most important thing to me in this book is this particular section here that I'd like to read for you. I'll hold it up to the camera there so you can see. And um, I'll even read it out while we hold it to the camera. So it's over on this side here. So we're talking about a deep structure and surface structure. That The deep structure is our authentic feeling and self, and the surface structure is our language, the way we represent our inner world in our own minds and the way we communicate it to other people. And here we can see that... Um, a acceptable therapist sentence is something that's well formed in English, contains no transformational deletions or unexplained deletions in the portion of the model in which the client experiences no choice. Um, it contains no normalizations, contains no words or phrases lacking referential indices, contains no verbs incompletely specified, contains no unexplored prepositions in the portion of the model in which the client experiences no choice, and contains no sentences which violate the semantic conditions of well-formedness. Isn't that a mouthful? So it's ironic that a model of communications is often so badly communicated as to what it is. But if we say that language and the way we represent language in the mind, and when we think back to my previous video, when we were talking about Hod on the Tree of Life, it's representing the mind and language, the structure that we give our emotional and unformed state, then here we can see a model that tries to make a authentic link between how we express something and how it's represented deep inside us. And quite often we can pick up and they modelled Virginia Satir and her use of language, her intuitive use of language, like a good Bene Gesserit witch. Um, and if you can ever watch videos of Virginia Satir at work in family therapy, they are absolutely mind-boggling clever, gorgeous, elegant, and really, really powerful. And the work she was able to do just by gestures, just by positioning people in a room, just by talking and listening, but in a Bene Gesserit sort of way. And, be, and Bandler and Grinder modelled this pattern on the way she and Ericsson and other people uh, worked that they were modelling. And so as an example of all of that complexity in a simple way, if we think about nominalization that this talks about, it's talking about well-formedness between our surface and our deep structures. So an example of where that isn't working is someone who says, um, I don't have self-confidence or I don't have confidence or... I don't feel love or I um, um, don't get trust at work. Now, what that is linguistically on the surface level is it's not a very well-formed statement because it's a nominalization. So something that is a, an action, it's a verb, is a behavior, is a process, is being given as a thing. So trust is like a thing that you take or are given or don't have, like it's an object. But trust isn't that. Trust is a process. The same with love. You can't give someone love like it's in a, in a package, that it's a thing. It's not something you can put in a wheelbarrow, as my English teacher once said. A noun is anything you can put in a wheelbarrow. And so when someone is saying they don't get trust at work, They'll never get trust at work because you can't be given it. It isn't an object. So it's a break in that well-formedness between the sort of surface level and the deep level. This is the structure of magic. It's linguistic structure. It's a um, well-formed structure, an authentic structure, complete 
comprehensive, consistent and congruent, as I talk about in states of awareness in the initiatory system. So, and you can see all of the seeds for that were planted when I read this book when I was 19. And so, as a counsellor, a therapist, a Virginia Satir or a Milton Erickson might say to that person, what would it be like if you got trust? What would it be like if you were trusted? What is being loved to you? How does that manifest? And so on. So they would prompt it back to a more well-formed observation of how that person represents the world, that it isn't an object, and so they gently correct that, make it more well-formed semantically in language for the client, and gracefully move them to a situation where they understand um, how they're going to recognise love in their life and how they're going to go about that and what it means to them and how they're going to feel about that, that it isn't something they are somehow missing. Like when people say that they have low self-esteem, um, Bandler, um, Richard Bandler, one of the two authors of this book and the co-founder of NLP with um, uh, uh, um, John Grinder, um, would say, um, so where's the self-esteem escaping from? Um, is it like steam just escaping out of you? You can't lose self-esteem. Self-esteem is not a thing, it's a process. It's the same with when people talk about the ego or transcending the ego in occultism or mysticism. Um, a lot of people who talk about that are still having a problem with it because they're making it an object, not a process. Um, the, the ego or ego is a process manifesting out, out of and within the psyche and its sense of separation rather than um, an actual thing itself. Even saying its sense of separation in terms of the psyche and calling it the psyche when in fact it's our personality process in time, it's, it's, it's convoluted, it isn't an accurate representation of a process. It isn't the self, it is self in beingness. Um, and nine times out of ten we can accept these semantic, um, badly formed sentences. We don't correct everyone over the dinner table or in the pub about that but when it's causing someone a real problem in their life then that's when we can dig deeper and unpick that lack of well-formedness so the structure of magic was very influential to me in terms of introducing the idea of language as a representation of our experience and there being a more well-formed way of, of of working with it of dealing with it of seeing it so there's also the structure of magic too, um, same wizard. And the books I bought around the same time um, from the early days of NLP are Change Your Mind and Keep the Change, um, Reframing and Transformations are the classic ones with these sort of classic sort of 70s, 80s covers. I bought this one from Mail Order Hypnosis Books in Scarborough. <laughs> so um, those are the original sort of NLP type books and, of course, Frogs into Princes. Now, those aren't the books that I necessarily recommend to a beginner. If you really want to understand the NLP, then um, my own book, NLP Magic, um, I'll try and put it there in the video if I'm learning my video editing correctly. And the other book that I really highly recommend is Don't Think a Purple Spotted Oranges by Martin um, Shervington. The manual you were meant to get with your brain. This is ideal because it hardly mentions NLP, um, but it is a nice, simple, almost childlike book for... Um, explaining NLP, I don't necessarily believe in IQs the way that um, they're taught, to be honest, but um, they're in there. Um, it's a really nice exploratory book um, for NLP, 
and this idea about um, language representing your inner experience and the way you tell yourself things and the manner in which you tell yourself things um, uh, affecting you. So on the in history system, as I keep coming back to with the Tree of Life, this is also that Yisod Malkuth area, the bottom of the tree, where we're trying to look at our Hod and Netzach, our emotional state, our mental state, our language communication, and that little triangle at the bottom of the Tree of Life. So whilst the NLP led me to develop my tarot along those lines and introduce some of the techniques into the way I was reading for people so that I could use the language in um, as powerful a way as possible via the cards that I was reading in order to effect change with my tarot clients. It also introduced me massively to the work of Milton Erickson and Virginia Satir. I'll cover those in a separate video. I'm going to do a new series at some point on um, deep dives into the five most important concepts in NLP, in Western Esotericism, in Kabbalah, and so forth as good introductory um, videos, I hope, into those subjects. But for now, I want to look at Virginia Satir and this book, Conjoint Family Therapy. Um, Satir mainly worked in the field of family therapy and group therapy. And the important bit of this book for me is chapter 10, Concepts of Therapy, where she talks about the um, general concept of therapy and her overall model for it. Now, interestingly enough, um, she didn't like to read Bandler and Grinder's models of her work because she wanted to keep it intuitive. She didn't really want to formulate it into a way she would then be herself self-conscious about the way she was talking, the methods she was using. And um, despite that, there is a model in here that I... I tend to see it as my touchstone. This is the aspiration that I'm working for, I guess, myself. And when I'm working with clients, certainly in self-change work, this is the touchstone that I'm aiming um, them towards as well as, as myself. And this is her concept of maturation, as it's um, mentioned here, maturation. Again, the state of this book is just because I've had it a long time and used it an awful lot. So let me read um, um, the patterns that characterize what she calls a mature and functional person. And this is my own touchstone, my magical and esoteric touchstone. Um, it's something to aim towards, uh, maybe always fail to... Um, uh, achieve in full, but certainly as an aspiration or touchstone to measure other things. She says, the patterns of behaving that characterize a mature person we call functional because they enable them to deal in a relatively competent and precise way in the world in which they live. Such a person will, and she lists these things, manifest themselves clearly to others, and we all know people and sometimes ourselves, when we are not manifesting who we are to other people, we're somehow repressing it, suppressing it, projecting, introjecting, um, uh, trying to trick people or ourselves in some way, or feel that someone is putting on a false persona or is acting up because someone else is around and all of these things. The mature person and the touchstone says that someone is able to manifest themselves clearly to other people. That that person will be in touch with signals from their internal self, thus letting themselves know openly what they think and feel. We've got their hod and net sack on our tree of life again. So that is, is a touchstone to say, are we always in touch with ourselves? and being true and authentic and receiving our own internal messages, our intuition, our gut feeling, our instinct, our mind, our emotional state, our thoughts, our experience, our understanding, our 
wisdom and knowledge, tree of life references there, um, for are we in touch with each of these signals from ourselves? Do, do, we, do we have that? Third thing, a mature person will be able to see and hear what is outside themselves. It's differentiated from themselves and is different from anything else. This is the thing that the baby does not have, but the mature person should aim to have. The other things outside of themselves are different to themselves. We see this talked about a lot when people talk about so-called narcissists and narcissistic behavior and gaslighting and things that sometimes um, a, a pathological person or a sociopathy someone with a, some form of sociopathy however that might be diagnosed and what the symptoms of that might be will often not really have such a clear cut distinction between the outside world and them and that can even border on paranoia or overlap into paranoia and things like this where where it's like the world is somehow as it is represented internally and not something different. So a mature person should be able to see and hear what is outside of themselves as differentiated from themselves as different from anything else. Something we can all strive to aim for, I think. Um, D, they should behave toward another person as someone separate from themselves and unique. And that's, I think it sounds common sense, but it's something we can sometimes forget, particularly if we feel threatened or depressed or tired or, or whatever. And certain people may trigger that than others. But we have to represent everyone and, and recognize people as being separate and unique and just celebrate the diversity and difference of every single human being to each other. Another good thing, I think, about all of the NLP stuff is that it really does, when you apply it with people, um, it, none of us panic in the same way. None of us feel good in the same way. None of us represent the world in the same way at all, from one individual to another, never mind from one continent to another, one time zone to another, one culture to another, one um, uh, background or family to another. We are all very, very different. Um, and uh, the touchstone is that we remember that all of the time. That we treat the presence of differentness as an opportunity to learn and explore rather than as a threat or a signal for conflict. Again, this is coming mainly from a family therapy background, but I think it applies to each of us. That a mature person will treat the presence of differentness as just a with curiosity as an opportunity to learn something new, to um, be open to a new experience, to um, explore it rather than as immediately reacting to differentness as a threat or a signal for conflict. That we should deal with persons and situations in their context in terms of how it is rather than how they wish it to be or how they expect it to be. Um, whether we hope or fear, it's irrelevant to the actual reality of a situation as it's presented. And quite often, one of the challenges in family therapy is everyone recognising what is actually going on, not what their hopes and expectations are for their parents, for their children, for their siblings and their extended family. That a mature person should accept total responsibility for what they feel, think, hear and see, rather than denying it or attributing it to others. And that's something that our NLP work tends to examine. Are we owning it ourselves as our own response or are we saying that someone else is angry when in fact we are interpreting what they are doing as them being angry? We can't mind read, as it's called, in terms of semantic language well-formedness. So all we can say is when that person does this, this and this in this context, I feel that they are angry and that's how I interpret that behaviour. And um, sometimes that may not always be the case. The other person might be... Might, self-describe themselves and be accurate in that self-description as saying that they're frightened 
but then that triggers different things in different people and we have problems because we are not all living up to Virginia Satir's excellent touchstone here. And then finally, that that person, the mature person, will have techniques for openly negotiating the giving, receiving and checking of meaning between themselves and other people. That, um, and again, this is something we try and introduce, I guess, in all therapy in terms of what um, we might call reframing in NLP, that, um, that people have methods of actually communicating their inner state and um, recognizing all of these separate states in other people and going through all of those touchstone items so that they can actually have a clear, authentic communication at the deep level, not just at the surface, um, argumentative level um, at all. So um, that is my book for episode six, The Structure of Magic, but it is a book that leads into a whole rabbit warren of Benny Gesserat skills to be able to communicate clearly and to understand how other people are communicating as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the um, book that still stays with me is Conjoint Family Therapy um, as being an ideal touchstone to which we can all strive, certainly in our personal lives, even if we are um, attempting a magical life, a spiritual life, a religious life, a life of faith, a life of um, whatever it might be, that at a um, psychological level with our friends, family, the people around us and so forth, that it is good to have a touchstone. And whatever touchstone you have for yourself or you choose for yourself or you adopt for yourself. Uh, the one that I found most useful in my life is the one in this book by Virginia Satir. And I came to Virginia Satir through Dune and the structure of magic, my choice for the book for this episode. So thanks a lot for sticking with me as I go through the unscripted sessions. Um, perhaps future sessions will be scripted or certainly have um, presentation notes or something like that. And again, if you've got any questions about NLP, about its relationship to tarot, then uh, my book Tarosophy really covers that, but I'm happy to answer questions here as well. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thanks a lot.